sense. <laughs> um, we'll get <laughs> we'll get started uh, right now. Looks like we have a full TSC. Is Jeff is Jeff uh, Jeff Brewer here? Yeah, he's here. Cool. Nine out of nine. Perfect. Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Cool. Um, we'll get started. Um, we have a fairly, uh, you know, somewhat packed agenda today. Um, we're going to be welcoming some new TOC members, um, notifying folks about a chair election that we'll hold now that we have a full uh, TOC roster. Um, we'll discuss kind of the project presentation meetings that happened last week and how that went. Um, talk a little bit about CNCF SIGs. Um, we have a annual review presentation from the Spiffy uh, community since it's about uh, a year since they entered the sandbox. Uh, and then we'll kind of open up for any community discussions, backlog, et cetera, et cetera. So let's uh, get going. Next slide, Taylor. So uh, just a little heads up on some new projects that have entered the sandbox. Um, both Brigade and Cubedge uh, came in. So uh, great to see those come in. Um, I kicked off the vote for Creo to enter uh, incubation uh, this morning and uh, we're still waiting on a little bit more due diligence on OPA before moving to an incubation vote. So I think we're waiting on Mr. Brendan uh, Burns to put in his um, due diligence there. And uh, anyone in the community is welcome to provide uh, input there if they have had success using OPA or have any uh, critical feedback. Yeah, I'll, I'll be ready with that next week. So. Okay. So clarify yeah. for me. Like the, next, uh, the, sorry, next, Brendan. the next meeting like, is what I meant. Okay. Sounds, sounds good, Brendan. Uh, who else was talking at the same time? So this, this Joe. Um, is it Creo or Cryo? That's a good question. Where is I, I would like to clear this up. Cryo, as far as um, go on my Cryo. Yeah. Cryo. Cryo is the preferred nomenclature. All right, good to know. Cryo. Okay, that's going to take me a while. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, and, and the you know thanks, Brendan, and the, you know anyone in the community is kind of welcome to comment on on OPA too. So as as the due diligence is going on, especially if you're using it and production or have any critical feedback. Um, cool. Next slide. Uh, most important news. Um, so uh, we have two uh, new TOC members um, that have joined us today. So um, Liz Rice uh, has come on board and has taken um, Kelsey's uh, slot after he uh, stepped down um, due to commitments. And then uh, Michelle Norelli has uh, taken the TOC selected uh, slot. So I'm super excited to uh, welcome them both and I and really thank both Kelsey and Quinton for all the kind of amazing work they've done and I've added them to the emeritus thing. So with uh, Liz and Michelle on the call, uh, you're welcome to uh, say hi or, or say anything uh, in terms of your thoughts of being on the TOC. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Hi, I am. This is Liz. Uh, I am super excited to be part of this. Um, I, because I've inherited Kelsey's chair, I have somewhat less than a year and I'm quite keen to make sure that, you know, things have happened in that slightly less than a year. So, um, yeah, I hope that uh, with the rest of the amazingly smart people on this team, we can uh, make some things happen as far as the TOC is concerned. I'm also really excited to be here. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for the opportunity. Um, I've been hanging out around uh, doing CNCF stuff for a few years now. And so I just feel really uh, grateful to, per to be a part of um, this particular uh, group of people. And I think I'm most uh, looking forward to the CNCF SIGs and um, uh, that being formed. I think that's gonna provide a great venue um, for a lot of really interesting uh, conversations around on uh, cloud native stack. So um, just really pumped. Thanks. Awesome. Glad to have you both. Um, just in an order of kind of governance related things. Um, we are seeking nominations for the TOC uh, chair, which will close at the end of this uh, week. And then we'll do the formal election. I believe um, Liz and uh, Mr. Joe Beta has volunteered. So if there's any other TOC members that are interested in that slot, feel free to make a comment on, on the issue posted posted below. Cool, uh, next slide. Uh, just reminders on uh, our wonderful KubeCons coming up. So Barcelona is the one uh, that's kind of immediate um, on attention uh, that everyone should look at. We published the schedule 
which is great. Thanks for your patience on there. I know it was a little bit uh, delayed, but it's, it's packed. Um, some sponsorships are available towards the end of this month. And uh, now in terms of uh, attendance, uh, we're tracking for probably somewhere around uh, a little over 10,000 folks attending, which is a little bit um, uh, wild. We had about uh, 3,000 or so signed up before the schedule was even, <laughs> was even live. So um, after that, uh, we have China and, and North America uh, coming up. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out and, and we're happy to have a conversation uh, around any of these events. Next slide. Uh, another kind of uh, shameless final call for Summer of Code. If you're interested in mentoring projects, um, we have an amazing kind of set of ideas um, already there. But uh, if you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out to um, Ehor, uh, me, or, or anyone that's part of the GSOC admin uh, list. Next slide. So yeah, project presentations. Um, so we've recently moved to this model where uh, every second uh, Tuesday uh, of the month, we're kind of going through the backlog uh, last week, we had uh, three pre project presentations, um, which kind of worked pretty well. I don't know how people feel uh, about it, but I think it kind of went uh, pretty well. Um, we're going to continue to do this. Um, if there are particular projects uh, that the TOC wants to see slotted for the next one around next month, um, let me know since uh, you essentially get the control, well, the schedule uh, for that one. But any other feedback from the TOC or community uh, on, on this particular uh, method of, of going through the backlog. Yeah, Chris, I was just wondering, um, I think we originally planned to do this every other week. Uh, so all the in between weeks between the TOC meetings. Um, my, my thinking is that we've got a ton of existing projects up for annual review. Yep. And then we've got an additional backlog of, uh, you know, projects wanting to come in. So I think we probably need two of these a month, not one. I don't know what the general consensus is. I don't want to overload everyone with presentations either, but uh, I think we're going to end up with this never-ending backlog again if we don't get rid of some of them. I actually had a, a similar question, which was, is there a, or, or what, what is the annual review schedule? Is that part of that backlog? Is there a separate list of? Yeah, you, <clears throat> you could build that basically from, uh, if you go to the GitHub repo for the CNCF TOC, and if you look through basically all the sandbox projects um, and their um, entry date, you could kind of see when, when, they're, when they're due. I don't, I don't think we're too crazy for the next uh, few months, maybe, maybe a couple, uh, but I'll see if I could kind of go build out that, that list. Um, my personal thing is I, I don't think we need another meeting a month right now. At least I'm not feeling like we do, but uh, I'm happy to oblige if, uh, if people want one. Yeah, I guess the question is if we do three a month, uh, you know, how long does the backlog last in months? And my, my guess is it's many, many months, and I guess that's too much. <laughs> do we need presentations? No. Not for everyone. So it's, it's basically you kind of request what you want for graduated projects. Yes, there's a hard requirement. Yeah, my uh, feeling is that if we, if we do a bunch of presentations, we're, we're just never going to get to any of the other work that we would like to do. So I, th I think my personal preference would be to try to do the the project stuff probably async. Like, is it possible that we could look through GitHub PRs and different docs, and then if people feel that we that we need a presentation, we could do one. Yeah, that works. If you link off that uh, project board, we should kind of see what's what's due. I mean, we have to fill up next month's meeting anyway, so. So, so is that saying essentially before we do a presentation, we kind of have a pre-presentation, I mean, essentially a step where we say, do we want to spend time on a presentation? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's my feeling is that I think if, if people would have presented previously, we could just ask them to send us collateral, whether that be slides or a doc or a, or a GitHub PR. And then I, I think maybe there could be some some reasonable review period where we look at everything and then, you know, if it seems like we want a presentation, we could ask for one. Uh, I'll Go just ahead. try here. Um, I get what Quentin is saying. I just think that maybe for the time being, we should continue with the one meeting a month since, I mean, for me, I'm still getting onboarded and I know there are several other new members on the TOC. So I would love to revisit this idea 
uh, maybe like next month or the month after once we've got our uh, feet wet. Uh, Liz, I cut you off. I apologize. No, I agree with you there, Michelle. I think uh, changing the process before we've got used to the current process. Yeah. Unless we think that there have been presentations that perhaps we shouldn't have had. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that we cancel the presentation meeting. I was mostly responding to having a second presentation meeting. Uh, so I, I, I'm just trying to avoid us spending a ton of time in, in presentation meetings. Yeah, I, I actually, I was just going to second Matt's idea because I think when we faced a similar situation in the steering committee with charters, um, this sort of divide and conquer approach worked pretty effectively for burning down the backlog of big charters. Um, and, you know, yes, we won't get a presentation from every project, but that's, it's probably better that we don't have that and we cover the backlog than we wait for nine months to cover the backlog. Anyway. The other thing, too, is that, I, I mean, my feeling is that hopefully once the SIG start up, it, I mean, shouldn't we be pushing, uh, you know, the, the first tier of reviews to, to them, right? So I think that would also help. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. agree. Um, if I could chime in, I think it's really important, though, that we're communicating to these projects, um, just because I've had a couple projects that have been in the queue close to nine months, and they're reaching out weekly every two weeks wondering what is going on. And I don't think that's a, a good spot to put a lot of these projects in, in this weird, what are we waiting for? We're on the backlog. Are we ever going to get scheduled? You know, I think it's only fair that if we don't feel like some of these projects are going to be reviewed, that we're prompt about letting those people know or asking them, you know, for more information up front um, and trying to get them on a schedule so they understand where they stand because that's just been my feedback I've gotten from a couple different projects is they feel like they're kind of just hanging out waiting and they don't know what's going on. So maybe we could improve our communication out to those people. Yeah, just I think that makes sense. One last very brief comment, so because so, I was the one who put the proposal forward to to have these um, meetings. The intention is not that they be mandatory for all TOC members or anything like that, that they're just a forum where if people want to find out about a project that is wanting to get into the CNCF, they, they, there is a place, they, they happen. If a TOC member or anyone else in the community is interested, they attend that meeting, and if not, they don't. Um, and obviously, if there's a TOC member who would really like to find out and interact with the team, um, they, they can just, you know, request that that, that uh, presentation be postponed until some date when, when they're able to attend. Uh, so, so, yeah, don't think of this as extra workload. It's, it's additional optional information available to everyone. And they're all recorded, so you can watch them afterwards as well. Can you point me to the recordings for these? Because I'm trying to find it right now, and it's not obvious. Am I blind? It should be on the CNCF YouTube channel, but I'll... Uh... Okay. My... Okay, cool. I'll send you some stuff offline, Chris. Yeah, cool. All right. Okie dokie. Let's uh, move on uh, on this topic. CNCF 6, just a reminder that the vote is out. Um, really looking forward to kind of getting this improved and just a reminder that we'll be bootstrapping uh, this process uh, with kind of the governance security focus SIG, who's kind of been a great kind of beta slash pilot um, kind of customer for this. So vote is out, check out the CNCF TOC uh, mailing list for it. So keep going, keep going. All right, now we have the annual review for uh, one of our sandbox projects, uh, Sp Spiffy slash Spire Community. So I'll hand it off to either Sunil or Andrew uh, who will be giving the presentation. Oh, hello, Sunil here, or Andrew. If you're on the phone, you need to do star six to unmute. Six. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? It's Sunil. I'm Skypeal. <laughs> yeah, we hear you now. Oh, geez, this star six was uh, more complicated than I thought it was going to be. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, um, <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm, I'm in the car. I'm driving, but uh, I'm happy to talk through, uh, talk through the slides and uh, give you guys all 
a quick update on, on the Safety Inspire projects. Um, I can't see the slides, so I can go by slide number because I remember the slide numbers. Uh, I assume we're on slide 16, which is the overview slide. Yep. Um, and I'll start from there. So uh, as a reminder for, for those of you um, who are new to the CNCF, uh, or haven't necessarily been paying attention to the world of authentication and security in the CNCF, Spiffy Inspire um, are two projects within the CNCF that are designed to uh, effectively provide and promote a way to securely identify software services in this increasingly dynamic and heterogeneous environment. Um, Spiffy, just to level set across the board, is really a set of specifications, right? And it's encapsulated within within three elements. First is something that allows you to define, you know, how a service mutually identifies itself. We call that a Spiffy ID. Uh, the second is a way to encode those IDs into some sort of a cryptographically verifiable document. We have two forms of that. Uh, first, we started with X509. We also have the JSON token format as well. And third, but not least, is the uh, API specification um, that allows for uh, applications and infrastructure to, to get these experts as part of their, uh, their runtime, and that's the world of API as a whole. Spire uh, is the uh, one of the implementations of Spiffy. Basically, allows to, it takes those three standards and uh, lets you actually do something with those in an environment uh, without having to do too much uh, too much heavy lifting per se. Um, some of the use cases that come up around Spire have primarily been around the areas of Secure authentication amongst the services. Another one that's shown up over the last uh, years. I think we lost Sunil unless I'm going a little uh, crazy. Yeah, I think we lost him. It shows a, a no phone. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm here, guys. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. No worries. Oh, it looks like a cutout again. Maybe uh, come back to Sunil when he's got a better connection. Yeah, that's completely a reasonable option. Given other... Everybody, can you hear me again? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're back. Jesus, this is all right. Well, I, di I dial back in. Hopefully, this will be stable. I'll make this quick so we can so no, we no have to move on to somebody's in no a more stable that. location here. Yeah. So let me go to slide 17, which is uh, the timeline slide. So if you remember from the time that we brought this project in, I mean, the, the history of Spiffy Inspire uh, it can be rooted back to almost 2002, going back to some of the work that was happening inside of. Uh, Plan 9, which was in Bell Labs. Uh, a lot of the learnings that I think the community has, thanks to, to work by Joe Beta and others, uh, stems from uh, the initial implementation we learned about uh, at Google back in 2005 through its loss infrastructure. And since then, we've made some really great progress, not only getting Spiffy Inspire uh, deployed and launched at KubeCon North America 2017, but then having this project welcomed in since then in April of 2018 as well, which was last year. And I think that's at the conference where Andrew and, and others were able to participate in the keynote and talk a little bit more about the project as a whole. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that since that time, we've had a really interesting uptake in terms of our overall community. Um, you know, we've got 432 participants in the Slack channel. Uh, not all of them are actively participating day in and day out, but you know, we are seeing a slow and steady up and to the right. Uh, both in terms of active participants as well as active messaging across the board. 
our community, our conversation happens in Slack. Uh, we have a variety of mailing lists that we use to we use to echo documents or to communicate uh, things to people that, uh, you know, just because that's the way we do things. But most of the day, day is happening inside of Slack, and we're, we're pretty excited, in particular, by the most recent uptick uh, in activity. So if you go to slide, slide 19, you'll see that across the board, and this is just a representation of some of the companies that have really been jumping in here, including Square, VMware, Uber in particular, Twilio, Pinterest, and a few others, who've all showed up and have been spending time with the project uh, trying to understand, you know, how can they actually align their use cases with what these building blocks allow for them to do inside their organization as a whole. Some organizations like Pinterest um, are very much of the mindset to be able to standardize around Spiffy and the Spiffy identity format itself. They already have the machinery and the equipment to be able to do secure authentication uh, based on the technology that they've been working on for the last number of years. Other organizations like Square and Uber are, are looking at being able to replace existing forms of kind of service to system authentication across the infrastructure whole hog. And so what that's translating into is just a myriad of capabilities that are finding its way into both uh, the standards and SNFI as well as within the open source code base itself that inspires a whole. You know, the numbers of these projects in terms of stars and commits and contributors you know, these are nice, these are interesting. We're working very hard as a community to continue to, continue to drive that. Uh, we've become fairly disciplined. We've always been fairly disciplined in terms of how we engage our community. We have regular community days once a quarter now. We bring the community in together. The next one's happening in May. Um, and so being able to use that as a way to continue to promote not only Spiffy and Inspire, but to promote the adjacent ecosystem of technologies, whether it's in policy, or anything else in between, talk and notary and things of that sort. And so we've been pretty excited by kind of a pull uh, from other communities uh, into, you know, learning more about Spiffy Inspire as a whole. If you go to the next slide, slide number um, 20, you'll see here are some of the features that we've been working on as a community. So on the left side are what we consider to be some of the, the core building blocks of, of Spire from a code base. As I, as I mentioned before, JOT as a, as a transport mechanism is something that came about very early on. Uh, a lot of folks said that we needed a mechanism, aside from X509, that allowed for you know, these spiffy identities to find their way through some sort of a middleware device, whether it was an HI gateway or an L4 load balancer, or something along those lines. So we very quickly heard that community move forward and build out a spec as well as implementation support within Spire's uh, infrastructure as a whole. Uh, workload API work continues to develop. We're working with a number of participants on that. Um, one of the ones to highlight on the call uh, is Google. So we've been spending time re-engaging with Google and the Istio team around trying to identify ways in which we can kind of align our thinking, our resources, and our story around the value of multi-factor authentication for services, which is how we, how we define and uh, inspire. Uh, and then being able to talk about the value that, that brings not only to folks that are in an on-mesh world talking to Kubernetes, uh, folks that are talking to off-mesh infrastructure as well, which is a large chunk of the Fortune 2000 as a whole. So we're pretty excited about some of the work that uh, we've seen, as well as some of the foundational engagement from our partners like Google, from ThoughtWorks, who has a consultancy who's bringing a lot of companies into the fold and teaching them about what the value of Spiffy Inspire is. Uh, and there's a lot more down the path as well that we worked on too. On the left, on the right hand side, you'll find um, basically a listing, a snapshot from our website about the number of plugins. So as you'll remember, one of the key features of Spire is the fact that we built a fairly extensible, fairly easy to consume plugin framework that allows for people using Spire to write their own plugins. So if you want to be able to do node attestation, if you want to be able to use your own upstream CAs, if you want to use your own key management systems, or if you want to use your own backend data store, you have a plugin framework that has been fairly well exercised by a number of folks, and we expect to see more of these coming forward over the coming year. If you go to the next slide, it'll take you to some of the integrations we've had. So customers and folks that are using this, I think, are looking at us and the community of open source technologies, as well as commercial vendors, to showcase how these technologies can be used together. 
And so over that time, we've had a number of great uh, opportunities to engage with folks across both the issuing side, in terms of those that issue spiffy identities, as well as those that consume spiffy identities. And I'm not going to read this slide to you, but you can get a sense of you know, who those stakeholders are and, and uh, the kind of work that we've been doing along the board there. Um, I expect to see more happening on the world of CAs in particular. Uh, I expect to see more happening in the world of more traditional identity and access management systems as well. We've had a number of folks in the community asking us about our ability to plug into technologies like Venify and CyberArk and Okta and others along those lines that I think are already embedded within the large enterprises as a whole. So we expect to see more work coming with those communities over the coming year as a whole. If you go to the next slide, this leaves you to the last slide, which is really kind of you know, focusing on our roadmap over the next year. Um, you know, you can read the slide for yourself, and I won't share the details there, but this is going to be a very great year for us. It's start, starting with KubeCon uh, Barcelona, which is happening in just a few months. We have, I believe, five presentations from Cytel and from other community members, including Uber and others, talking about the work that we're going to be doing around Spiffy Inspire. Some of that work is going to be highlighted around things like uh, high availability. We've already got HA built in in terms of being able to run multiple servers, uh, Spire servers to, to have bill over. Uh, but we're looking beyond that. We're looking at load testing. Uh, we're looking at uh, tighter integrations with uh, systems like Istio as well. Uh, we're also looking at trying to make Spire just a heck of a lot more turnkey with Kubernetes. Uh, we had quite a bit of feedback in Q4 of last year about uh, the fact that our documentation, our examples, our libraries were really not uh, well built for somebody who was starting with Kubernetes uh, and wanted to get started with Spiffy Inspire. Uh, we took that as a, as a challenge, and over the last two and a half months, I turned through and really done a, a 180 in terms of our footprint in telling the story of how to, people, how, how to help people use Kubernetes Inspire uh, as a well. whole. I expect more work to happen there uh, over the coming months, and I expect more work to just happen around making this stuff accessible to people. The early adopters really have a burning pain or they have a really good understanding of PKI at scale. Most folks don't, and most folks shouldn't really have to, right? And so I think what we're really hoping to do is work with the community to build more examples, to build more case studies, to build more webinars, and to continue to drive and showcase why this is important, not only for their infrastructure, but as they move towards a cloud-native world. So. With that, I'll put, I'll put myself on pause and happy to take any questions anybody might have. So, uh, hey, Sunil, this is Brian. Uh, Spire 1.0 uh, production ready, is that when you expect to have uh, users starting to use Spire in production, or do you have some already? So right now, uh, Brian, I hope you can hear me right now. The production users that we have closest to this, uh, yes, we, we expect two people, two organizations by, uh, actually three organizations by Q3 of this year to be moving into, uh, to be moving into production. Uh, I won't share those names quite yet because I don't want to set those expectations for them when we don't have the clearance to, to share those names yet. But two of them already are in uh, in staging. They're in the middle of rollout and they're uh, kind of a production uh, into their infrastructure. Uh, and they're in the middle of driving some of the requirements around load testing and some of the additional security on they're going to be doing against the code base as a whole. We have a third that's going to be spinning up their exploration in their staging environments in Q3. And uh, we think there's probably another two or three more beyond that as well. I think by the end of this year, when we get to KubeCon, North America, whenever that might be, is when I expect for us to be able to talk about having, you know, at least three, four, or five production services, production uh, companies, or sorry, production implementations of Spire uh, being deployed out there. But we're not at that point yet. So well, I'm not here to tell you guys that we're all ready to go and that Spire and Spiffy are ready to make them move forward. We're not. We're still building our community. It is nice to see the progression. It is nice to see the engagement. We still have a lot more work to do to get this into the hands uh, of more production environments as a whole. Are there any other, one thing that uh, is being discussed is what 
projects need? Are there any other services uh, that CNCF could provide to you that would help your project? Uh, I think the, you know, the only other service that comes about, and, and this might be a broader conversation with uh, other you know, you know, projects that are not necessarily backed by, by larger enterprises and large enterprise footing, um, is you know, there's always more around how do you make this content accessible uh, to audiences, right? And so part of it for us is getting, our, uh, getting the opportunities to work with great technical writers, getting to work with great content producers, whether it's video or audio, and just trying to promote more of this story through better storytelling as a whole. Storytelling is hard, uh, and it's expensive for the best ones out there. And so opportunities where uh, we're able to tap into the CNCF collectively, I know there's a service that has a lot of great features which we have been taking advantage of, but particularly around the, the storytelling nature, around comms and marketing, the project in a material way uh, would be helpful. Now, I understand that you know, we're, uh, we're a sandbox project, and there's a sandbox project. I don't think sandbox projects are pretty and have access to um, those types of services that are available at this point. But that would always be helpful. Uh, in lieu of that, SciCal as one of the sponsors will continue to drive that initiative forward as best as it can. So the people you'd be trying to communicate with would be uh, additional contributors or uh some early adopter users that you could get feedback from or like what exactly? Correct. I think, yeah, I think some of the, the feedback that we're looking for is if we're trying to build interconnectedness between, you know, the, the CNCF projects, at least as one set of organi you know, organizations, I think really being able to showcase and have engagement with more of the broader swath of Kubernetes users. Now we might have a bit of a mismatch, right? The Kubernetes user base, might be different than those that are looking at Spiffy Inspire or OPA specifically, right? But I think being able to have different vantage points through which people can give us feedback on Spiffy Inspire and its, its accessibility. You know, what does Spiffy Inspire mean to me as a Kubernetes user? What does it mean to me as a gRPC user? What does it mean to me as a, as a, as, as a uh, you know, as a, as a, as a top or notary user? I think being able to have perspective from different communities uh, into the project is always helpful. Uh, but then again, we're one of multi multiple projects in here, and so I'm not going to say here that you know we have the you know the time to be able to to work with all of them. But Kubernetes as a community, as a first class community amongst you know the others in this uh, in this uh, ecosystem, I think is one where we're looking to actively engage uh, way way more uh, because of in part the work we've done over the last quarter as a community, but also because we think there's a lot more to go beyond that as well. Uh, so that would be one area, Brian. I think that uh, would be great to get some some engagement. Have uh, have you connected with the SIG auth uh, subgroup in the Kubernetes project at all? We have, yeah. So we uh, in 2018 we spent quite a bit of time uh, working uh, in concert with what was happening in SIG auth around trying to identify mechanisms around um, you know workload identity that was going to be native to not only Kubernetes but also useful to Istio and useful off of Kubernetes as a whole. Um, I think that there's there's wiggle room and space for, you know, different ideas to exist and as there should be. Um, but it seems as though, uh, you know, I mean, much like with our project, we've had to focus much on, on really kind of driving where a lot of the interest had been, which, um, you know, for the most part of 2018, until we started hearing about this in the back half of 18, had really been uh, coming off the mission, off Kubernetes. Um, and so that's where a lot of our effort and time was spent really optimizing around uh, what Spiffy was and what Spire needed to be able to deliver for, per se. Um, that said, though, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to re-engage uh, that group. Uh, I think there might be some, some learnings there and some, some learnings both ways. Um, even with Istio, for example, I think we, you know, we went down to Google uh, about a month ago or so, and we had a great conversation. I think you know, both of us were heads down working on our projects, and we picked our heads up for an hour and a half, and we're like, gosh, you guys are doing this. And, Yes, you're doing this, and there's just so much more overlap in terms of the world. There. And rather than create, you know, competing ideas, especially when we're trying to promote the same concepts to the same users, uh, I'd like for us to try to find more time and opportunities to engage and align, uh, especially because we're part of the same community as a whole. So a lot more work for Cytel and others in our community to do to make that happen. Okay, thanks. Um, I have uh, a little bit of questions. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I feel like you're saying all the right things and focusing on um, 
really awesome things like uh, working on community building and making your docs more approachable and um, going in depth uh, and, and having these conversations with potential end users and kind of seeing what feature sets they need. That all sounds great. Um, I'm just really curious. Um, I actually talked to some of the HashiCorp people about how and why they ended up um, using, I think it's just a, a spiffy. Uh, but I'm curious to know, like, um, what kind of teams are you talking to or who do you end up talking to at other uh, companies like um, Pinterest and Uber? Like what, what teams, how does that conversation start? Do they reach out to y'all or do you kind of target a particular group of people? Yeah, it, sorry, is this Michelle? I can't see faces. I'm assuming this yeah. is Michelle? Yeah, it is. Hey, Michelle, it's, uh, yeah. Cool, it's nice to meet you, by the way. We've never met before, but it's nice to meet you. Uh, the the communities that we have engaging with us, the, 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 the personas inside um, uh, organizations that show up and, and, uh, and are curious about Swift Inspire, they, they, let me give you one, one way of looking at segmentation. We have a lot of organizations that, um, uh, a, a lot of startups probably are not finding their way to Spiffy per se. Uh, I think that for many folks, Spiffy as a concept is particularly valuable and particularly useful when you are a hybrid cloud adopter of some form or fashion. Uh, if you're born in Amazon, or if you're born in Google, if you're born in Azure, uh, the tooling, uh, the security you know, kind of constructs for the most part are good enough. I think for a lot of folks. So we're not seeing uh, that kind of engagement, just you know, in the honesty and spirit of complete transparency. We're not seeing that kind of engagement from those sorts of teams, in part because this isn't a high order bit for them to worry about. Where we do have engagement is in, let's call it two classes of a large enterprise. One is I'll call Nouveau Enterprise, uh, organizations that are you know, less than 15, 20 years old, something along those lines, don't have a lot of, you know, don't have nearly the kind of technical debt and heterogeneity as you might find in a prototypical Fortune 100 that's been around for 30, 40, or 50 years. Um, but recognize that as their infrastructure starts to age, as their infrastructure starts to, to expand beyond their existing footprints, and as their personnel start to turn over, some of these foundational technologies like at Pinterest or at Square or other places like that that have been built by security engineering teams, or in some cases, identity and access management engineering teams, um, start to show uh, their wear and tear a little bit. And so we oftentimes will find ourselves uh, engaging with folks that are in those two types of organizations, trying to explain to them how we look at Spiffy and Spire as a potential next step in your journey as you become a cloud native organization as a whole. Now, you brought up HashiCorp. Uh, which is, you know, in all these organizations that we're talking to, it's a great company, it's a great piece of technology around Vault specifically here. But I think one of the things that we hear from folks is this idea that we want to evolve beyond the model of utilizing some sort of a secret. Right? We recognize that secrets are important and they are the way in which we do business today. But I think when people look at PKI, they look at it as a black box. They look at it as a dark art that is completely inaccessible and, and you know, could never possibly utilize this thing at scale. And I think when they look at Spiffy Inspire, I think they realize that there is a lot here to offer. There's a lot in terms of being able to use Spiffy Inspire in conjunction with Vault today, right, to be able to deliver value for near-term use cases and long-term use cases as they move into the cloud. The, the other uh, set of customers that we have are the Fortune 5000, you know, core security engineering teams that uh, have been building out their own Kerberos-based authentication infrastructure and look at this as a successor to a lot of the work that they've been doing there as well. So in some ways, it warms their heart that these constructs and ideas are not too dissimilar from things that they've worked on for almost 30 years, going back to you know, the Athena project at MIT, going back in 1980, 81. Um, and so we're engaging with those folks as well. The last thing I'll say is that we also have a set of stakeholders in enterprise architecture. So the number of enterprise architects in lines of business across the prototypical Fortune you know, 500 enterprises that show up and say, we have a mandate to move X percent of our infrastructure into Microsoft Azure, and uh, some percentage of that is going to run on Kubernetes. We have to figure out how we're going to make that happen. They find their way down to the security layer of this project that they're into, 
and they start to realize that they're going to be beholden to uh, processes and methodologies around authentication that oftentimes require days, if not weeks, of workflow time uh, to engage with the security team to get the right set of credentials before they can actually turn the button on and launch an instance of uh, whatever they have building in the cloud. So oftentimes they will find about Spiffy, and then they will bring us, Cytel, into their community and into their security team to teach their security organization about what's happening there. So we're getting pulled in by, by, by various stakeholders. Does, does that answer your question, Michelle? Yeah, it does. I definitely got a good sense of what kinds of people and, and teams are reaching out to you um, to talk about these kinds of things and why. So thank you. Um, are there any big challenges? Like this is a lot of stuff you're working on. Um, how big is your team and uh, do you have any big challenges? I know Brian Grant already asked this question um, and you mentioned uh, technical writing is an area that you'd like some help with, but uh, is there anything else that's concerning? Well, I think there's probably, I mean, to answer your question, Cytel is a company of 25 people. Uh, we're distributed around, around the United States, around the world. Uh, we could always be bigger, uh, like any company could be, but I think we're, we do really good work with the, uh, the size that we have. Uh, we also have a really engaged community. There's a set of individuals uh, that are probably on this call and beyond that are really, really passionate about being able to breathe life into these kinds of constructs to be useful in Kubernetes, off Kubernetes, and, and worlds beyond that as well. Um, I think one of the things that we always worry about, and maybe this is just the nature of being an early stage uh, project like, like this is, is we always worry about missing out on perspective, on missing out on use cases, missing out and not seeing something the way somebody else sees that because They've been living it. They've been breathing it for the last 20 years, and they have something to share there. And you know, I worry that you know we don't, we're not doing enough to make sure that there are forums or mechanisms to, for people to participate, not only in the code but in the design. Right? We're still in the design phase of some of these you know aspects of both the code base and the, the specifications as well. So you know, making sure that it's not just Cytel's perspective that's that's represented here. Trying to be intellectually honest about the fact that. We're not necessarily the owners of a project, we're the stewards of a project, and we have some perspective, but there's a heck of a lot more that's out there. So identifying ways of getting more feedback earlier on in the design process, I think is something that we're always, always eager in to, to see. Um, but uh, aside from that, uh, you, know, the, you know, we've got roadmap items, we've got you know, work to get done, we've got code to get built. Um, uh, you know, I don't think that there's much there that, that you know, is beyond the grasp um that, that we can't handle at this point awesome thank you so much i appreciate the perspective i i won't um take more time but i think this brings up um, really interesting points and threads we can talk more about great thanks michelle any other questions for me okay well thank you for the time and i appreciate the opportunity to connect with you guys we'll uh we'll see you in barcelona Thanks, Neil. Thank you. All right, moving on. I think we're pretty much um, towards the end of the call today. So unless anyone has any other discussion uh, topics or things to bring up, we could uh, give people about 10 minutes, <coughs> 10 minutes back in their day. All righty, cool. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up, and uh, it's great to have uh, some new TOC members. Uh, we'll do the TOC chair election uh, next week. Take care. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.